no doubt. Uh, before the Def Jam deal, you uh, also worked on DJ Quick's uh, Way Too Funky, correct? Yeah, I worked on that, yeah. Okay. What do you remember about the transition from Quick as the Name to Way Too Funky? The transition, it was a lot of excitement and anticipation on the second record. Because, you know, our artists usually fall off on the second record. You know, so we're trying not to fall off. And the song, the first single was Just Like Compton. And the premise of the song is like, because when we went out on tour, no matter what city we went to, every night was a fight. <laughs> you know, somebody got stabbed, somebody got shot at. So we were just like, yeah, no matter where we go, every, every city is just like Compton. That's how we came up with that song. Right. During you that know. time, what do you remember most about, uh, you know, different cities and, and, you know, things like fights and things breaking out? What do you remember most about that time? Well, we had we had two, two, big, two big fights. One was in Denver and one was in Phoenix, Arizona. The, the, you know, both of them was stupid scenarios, how, how they happen. Like, uh, we went to Denver, Colorado, it was at a skating ring, and all Quick had to do was walk off the stage because we was on the last song. And back then, folks had, you know, they had beepers. They start throwing beeper batteries at him on stage. And we had a, he had a 40 ounce bottle on stage and he threw it out in the audience. And smash, hit this guy in the face. And it was on from there, man. <laughs> it, just, it was crazy. You know, he ended up getting arrested that night for inciting the riot, you know. And then uh, we were in Phoenix, Arizona at the Celebrity Theater, which a Celebrity Theater is you're in the center, like, of the stage. The stage is in the center. It rotates. So everybody's around you. So nobody's not a bad seat in the house and not thinking where we were at, that that Phoenix is like a crip city and not thinking the Chicago Bulls had just won the championship. Cause we got just came from Chicago and he bought him a shirt with the Chicago Bulls on it, but it said real men wear red. And so he's on stage with the real man wear red shirt and all these crips is around him in, in this audience, you know, and the dumb, dumb bodyguard maced the first row of folks. Again, it was on from there, you know, we had to run out of there, you know. Wow, crazy times. Yep. Mm -hmm. Did that album uh, achieve the similar success as the debut album? The debut album went platinum, the second album went gold. Okay. You know, just the, just to go gold back in the day was a great achievement. That was five hundred thousand, right? Yeah, five hundred thousand. Nowadays, five you know five hundred thousand streams that's nothing. You, you a million streams is nothing. You know, it's like if I sold a million records back in the day, I, I could nice healthy check of maybe about six seven hundred thousand. Now yeah. I'm getting like four thousand dollars. Great difference. Right. You know. So that was around 1992. Uh, I think you end up at Def Jam around 93. What's your relationship uh, at this time with the, you know, the guys, Quick and all them, as well as with Profile to uh, make you transition over to Def Jam? Well, Profile, my, you know, at that time, we all disbanded. You know, like I said, they all get full of themselves, and you know, they all want to. That, that what really happened was. Def Rock. Mm. I wanted to go to Def Row. I wanted to hang out with Shug. And, and I'm going like, that don't make no sense. You got your own path. You don't need Def Row. All you need to do is make good records. And you're going to be just as big. Well, we are bloods and we want to hang out with our people. You know, I don't gang bang. I, even though I lived in LA all my life, I didn't gang bang. Never made sense to me. You know? Right. You know, I, I grew up in amongst Crips. I grew up among Bloods, so it didn't. I, it didn't do nothing for me. It didn't make no sense to me. Right. 
they, you know, quick and second decide they want to go roll with death row. Didn't make sense. You see where it ended up with nothing or nothing burger. Uh, AMG, he just decided like, nah, I don't, I don't gang bang. I'll just stop rapping. You know. Mm. So how did you wind up over at Def Jam and, and meeting a young Domino? Well, how I met Domino was, uh, I know you probably heard of DJ Battle Cat. Yes, of course. Battle Cat had, was working on a Bloods and Crips record. And I, yeah. I, I knew Battle Cat from, from DJing, and, and he used to rent equipment from me. And he, he came over one day. He knew I was doing looking for some artists. He came over like, hey, man, I got this, this artist. His name is Genuine Draft. Which is Domino's name on the Bloods and Crypt record. Now he bought Domino over. We jumped in the car, rode around. I, I listened to some some of his ideas, and I was like, "Yeah, this is this is going to be my comeback." And we, we worked on the Yellow Jam album. Didn't take long. It took about two weeks to put that album together. You know, and. Uh, so I Russell was in town and I was able to hook up with Russell Simmons and I played him the domino. He was like, let's do it. And rest is rest is history. Wow, First that time. easy. It was that it, yeah, it was that easy back in the day. Right. You know, now it's like there's so many phony people that that's blocking people from you know success. Right. You know. Yeah. What was that creative process like uh, with Domino for his debut album? It was cool. It was great. You know, basically, uh, me and my partner, we, we were spending a, um, we, we were spending our own money. So um, it was a cool, easy process. So you know, it was seamless. You know, right. Yeah, working with Def Jam, like I said, we got to do, we got to put it together how we wanted to put it together. You know, we had put the record together and we had started promotion, <clears throat> doing some promotion ourselves. You know, back in the day, LA had K Day. So we started getting some action on the radio and folks start calling. So it was how long? Easy. How long did it take, uh, as far as you're concerned, for Ghetto Jam to take off? Because the style was so different, it didn't take no time. Mm. You know, it just took like a week. Like I said, the process back then is a whole lot easier than the process now. The process right. now is everybody, you know, you got everybody, oh man, I can get you a million streams, I can get you this, I can just, you know, just pay me, you know. Right. Back then, everybody was, you know, easier to, easier to work with, and people was excited excited to see something else, you know, hear something else, without right. without any strings. Now it's so many strings, you feel like a puppet. Right now, exactly what role did you play in Domino's album? Executive produce. I, 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 all the stuff I, I I've ever put out, I executive produce, and I'm also. I also spent a lot of time in creative in the studio with it. Okay. You know, I just executive produce and produce. So, okay, no, we're going to get this guy to play guitar. No, we're going to get the uh, person to do this. So this this is what the song needs. You know, to me right now, there's not, there's a few good producers, but there are more beat makers now with the digital technology. And to me, the beat makers, all they do is here, here's a two track, do what you do. A producer knows what, what needs to go with that song, with that right. track. Yeah. How many uh, copies did that album, album end up selling? The Domino one ended up going, going platinum, platinum single, platinum album. Okay. And as always, how did life change for Gritty Greg at this point? Life changed for Gritty Greg because everybody was coming to me was trying to get a. Uh, Try to get a deal, want me to hear the records, hear the demo, uh, you know. Is there anybody that uh, handed you a demo, wanted you to get a deal that you passed on that you regret around this yeah. time? Mm -hmm. Well, this was before before Domino. Actually, I had 
Black Eyed Peas. Were they at Bl at Bland Clan then, or were they Black Eyed Peas? They was Black Eyed Peas, but they didn't have Fergie. Okay. And I, you know, I was like, mm, I'm doing gangster music. I don't know what y'all <laughs> doing. That ain't Black Eyed Peas, you know. Right. <laughs> so, you know. Wow. So, they ended up. Who they end up signing with? They signed with Interscope. Interscope. That's right. Mm -hmm. Wow. So how does uh, Greedy Greg, being from L.A., link up with a female from Detroit named Boss? Boss came lo looking for me after the success with, with Quick and AMG. Her and her DJ flew out here, but I was on tour. I was on the road. And she hooked up, ended up hooking up with uh, my partners. We had an office down, down in uh, South Central. She came and... It, that's how we connect with with, with uh, Boss. Did you get her a deal at Def Jam as well? It, it, it was an easy layup. You know, once, once you once you get inside the building, it's easy to follow through with something else. Right. <clears throat> now it's just so damn hard to get in the building. Right. You know? What do you remember most about a young boss? She knew what she wanted. She knew what she wanted. You know the direction. And what type of music, what type of songs. You know, the thing I liked about back then about female artists is no, let me say, let me say this. Now when a female artist comes to me, first thing I I ask them, I ask them one simple question. How naked are you willing to get? <laughs> <laughs> hey, because that's what it says, the direction is, you know. Oh, for sure. How much, how much ass are you willing to show the public? Right. I'm not trying to sleep with you, but how far are you willing to go? Right. Yeah. Exactly. What was that uh, creative process like with Boss in the studio? It, 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 it was easy, you know, because uh, we had we had a a, a, a good creative or a circus cir circle. You know, MG helped her a whole lot. MG quick helped her some. So and and, they, and that makes the process easy. You be mm -hmm. bouncing around ideals, you know. One right. person don't make a great song. It takes a whole bunch of uh, ideals really to make a great song. The thing I, I don't like about the process today is these artists think, okay, I make a a song on Monday Studio Tuesday. I'm supposed to be a superstar. It, it doesn't work that way. Right. Right. Did you also manage Boss? No. Mm -mm. Okay. No. I remember seeing her on the uh, Chronic tour and didn't know if you were joining her uh, at that time. She was opening act with Run DMC, and uh, who else was on that tour? I think the Ghetto Boys might have been on that tour as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, didn't know if you managed her or not. No, 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 no. I, at that point. I had some other groups that I was working with and trying to manage and trying to, I just, I, at that point, I just want to get deals and keep it moving. You know? Right. Management so, is kind of, kind of, kind of time consuming. Because right. artists want you, want you to fix their life. And if you're not careful as a manager, you lose your life. Mm. You know, meaning you, become so consumed about trying to make their 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 life run smoothly and they don't always be willing to take all your your creative input to make it work right it becomes a problem right up to this point um you are known for working with mostly hip hop art artists are mm -hmm. you ever uh you know does it cross your mind that you want to start working with r&b artists or how does uh well, that happen i, got, I worked with mocha and stuff the girl the girls group that had, had the song called he's mine right it was pretty big was real big i didn't realize how big it was until uh I was at an r kelly concert before he went to jail and they didn't have an opening act. They just had a DJ. And they played He's Mine. And this is like maybe about 10 years after I put the record out. And when they played the record, the women just went crazy and the people started singing. I was like, wow, this record is like a lot bigger than I thought it was. You know, I never thought it was that 
I thought it was cool. I thought it was big, but I didn't think it was that that big. Right. Um, right now, I'm working with an R&B artist named Jesus Rose. He, he's going to be the next. He's the next thing. He's going to be the next big thing. Next big he's, thing. We'll talk about him momentarily. What was it like working with Mocha Steph in the studio? Man, after after that experience, I said I'll never work with three girls again. <laughs> details, you know, details, please. Because you're dealing with three, 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 three uh, periods. Uh, you got to get three different outfits, three hairstylists, and make very, very, I remember, very. I remember huh? getting a glimpse of that with Warren G and uh, the five footers in that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what was that? The show. He had the group uh -huh. called the Five Footers, and he. Yeah, I remember them. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm sure you can relate to what he was going through. Yeah, because you got it with females. You know, you always got to have the hair. You know, you got to have always have the latest outfit. You know, I'm used to guys. You throw them a, 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 some five hundred ones and a white t shirt and some cool glasses, keep the haircut. It's on. Right. You know. It's just Did you see much? Did you mm -hmm. see much success with them? Yeah, yeah. Their, their album, their single went their, their single went platinum, but the album it just it just it was just timing. That's right. when you had seven oh two, you had total, you had uh <coughs> what's the girl's name out of I can't think of the girl's name they had the uh we had so the competition was stiff. Right. You know, and maybe Maybe I didn't, I don't know, maybe we just didn't, the album just didn't translate. I'll put it like that. Okay. So you end up working on Domino's second album, Physical Funk. What are you witnessing with Domino? I know you said usually after the second album, their head usually gets big. Is this a, a, a reoccurring thing? Or did I you? Him, I, I, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I'll be, I thought about it over the years. I made a couple of mistakes with Domino. After his first record started blowing up, uh, I tried I tried to teach him how he, he believed he can produce. So you tell me that you 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 can produce, and that's one of your dreams to be producer. So I tried I tried to facilitate that dream. I got him some work. He, he did a song with uh, Shaba Ranks and a couple other songs. So when it got to time to do his second album, instead of going back to the well, the Battle Cat well, I'm gonna produce. I'm gonna produce my own album. And okay, we're gonna roll with it. We roll with it, and didn't quite miss. We kind of kind of missed the mark. You know. Was he still signed to Def Jam at that time with the second album? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what we did, uh, I think the I think the first single was Physical Funk, and then we tried Physical Funk. I'm trying to think because we had to go we had to go back in after we thought we had finished the album. We, we had to go back in and try to try to. Uh, Touch it up a little bit, try to punch it up a little bit. Mm. And we should have just, we should have got Battle Cat and just say, you know, like, yo, but right. this ain't working. This ain't right. working. 